Friday night was interesting. We were over at the Walmart, which we usually do on a Friday night. And we had a newbie cashier guy with an employee behind him whispering in his ear how to do things, which was neat. And after we got done, there was nobody else in our line. We gave them each a pocket calendar. And usually people just take one and that's it. But the uh, lady behind this gentleman said, uh, can I have another one? And I said, would you like a couple? Yeah, I want a couple more so I can give them out. And I thought that was really cool. And the newbie said, yeah, can I have one for my mother, this younger fellow? And I said, sure. So I, they were really excited about getting them and, and sharing with them. So again, there's some really neat experiences. Uh, had a real neat one on this past Monday. I have spoken before about Ebenezer. He's in India. Oh, I don't know, many years ago, he had requested a pocket calendar. And we had sent him a pocket calendar. And then over the years, I've been on and off, we've been emailing back and forth. And um, he would ask us to send him calendars. So I was doing that. And then one year, he said, I want to know how many people are in your church. I want to give you calendars for each of your members in your church. And if you remember, many of you got a calendar that year from Ebenezer. So on Monday, when Ebenezer emailed me, he sent me a wedding invitation to attend his wedding on December the 15th in India. Now, can you imagine getting an invitation to go to India for a wedding on the 15th? And I said, well, I sent back, I said, I'd love to come, but unfortunately we're not able to make that. And uh, he understood, but I got a full wedding invitation. Guess how many guests are supposed to be at this wedding? Want to take a guess on that one? 1,000. Wow. They're expecting 1,000 people to be at his wedding. And he says, <laughs> he said, 500 of these are English speaking people. <laughs> I thought that was cool too. And he said, can you send me some pocket calendars to give out at the wedding? Uh -huh. Now, how many times do you get an invitation to send calendars for a situation like that? Well, you can imagine what it will cost to send 500 calendars, also being able to send them. And not everybody's going to want a calendar anyway. So I says, well, look, we can send you a couple hundred. So on, I guess, what well, was Wednesday? Wednesday, I packaged up and I sent 200 pocket calendars to India for him to give out to his wedding. So I want to pray that uh, the wedding's on the 15th. I sent them, so he should be able to get them in time for the wedding by sending them out when I did. But uh, keep him in prayer for his wedding. And I said, hey, be sure to send me some pictures, will you? So I'm looking forward to seeing some pictures of the wedding. And uh, again, pray for him and his new bride and that these calendars will be impacting the people that have not made a decision. There's plenty back there to take and give out. Thank you. Oh, Father, thank you for your, for your gifts to us. Lord, you are so good. Lord, we pray that you would meet with us today, that Jesus would be lifted up in the power of the Holy Spirit, that we might receive not the gifts of Christmas that are, are, are wonderful and, and colorful, but the true gift that is eternal. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh Lord, I think of the conversation I had with a young lady last night and how a hundred years ago Things were just so different. Someone my current age would be considered at the very end of their life. In fact, when Social Security was first begun, they picked 65 because most people, the majority of people, never reached 65. They picked that age knowing that it was something that only a, per, a, a percentage would even see. Today, 65 is, is considered certainly not at the end. Lord, 
you've been so good to us. We've experienced such blessings and we take it for granted. Warmth in the winter. Air conditioning in the summer. Fresh vegetables in December. But the greatest problem we have with food is we eat too much of it. Lord, these are things that the vast majority of all humanity couldn't dream of. Instant communication. We can stay in touch with loved ones hundreds or thousands of miles away. Two hundred years ago, if someone lived across the country, you might not hear from them for years on end and not know if they were living or dead. Today, we can talk to them every day. Oh God, You have been so good. And we've taken these gifts and we've used them not for Your glory, not in appreciation, but to spend them upon our desires and cravings. And then complain that You didn't give us more. Oh God, as we think about the gift that You gave, the ultimate gift. May our hearts be bent toward gratitude. May the narcissistic drive of our society be curbed because the Bible says of the worst of humanity, neither were they thankful. Deliver us from the coldness of these days. You've said, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many, the most, will grow cold. Lord, may that spirit of gratitude guard our hearts from the coldness that we see growing in our society and around the world. In Jesus' name, Amen. Can you imagine, can you imagine, you know, uh, we think about today standing to sing, and can you imagine being part of that crowd in Nehemiah's day, that they began to read the Word of God and they all stood to their feet and stood for six hours straight as they read from the Word of God and explained it. Can you imagine being part of a group that was so overcome uh, with, with the presence of God that you just couldn't sit down in His presence? And, and some of us have experienced great moves of God's Spirit, but, but there's always so much more, and whatever we've experienced is just a tiny taste of what God has done and can do and will do again. I was uh, talking in Sunday school uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about the tribulation period. We talk about today how hard people's hearts are. And people's hearts are hardened, aren't they? There is just so much anger and hatred in people. People are angry. They're bitter. And, and what's the difference between anger and bitterness? Because the Bible says be angry and don't sin. What's the difference? But the Bible also says, Hebrews 12, beware lest any bitter root spring up among you. What's the difference between bitterness and anger? Bitterness is anger rehearsed. If you begin to rehearse anger, it very quickly becomes bitterness. And as we look at our media today, and even our entertainment, so much of it revolves around rehearsing Anger. Anger against police. Anger against races. Anger against genders. Anger against, against, against. And we wonder why people are so bitter.
Today we begin our Christmas series, and we are going to be doing something that I haven't done exactly this way in, in this is my 32nd Christmas season here. Uh, so if you consider four, some occasionally five, but if you consider four Christmas messages plus uh, Christmas Eve would make five, and you multiply that out, that means that, that when we finish the Christmas season this year, on December, or the end of December 24th, uh, I will have preached 160 sermons about Christmas. People say, oh, it must be really wonderful. You're coming into the Christmas season. That must be just so easy. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Try coming up with something new and fresh uh, after 160 messages. But we're going to do something I hope, uh, I know it's new, I hope it's fresh. We are going to be looking at Christmas in each of the four Gospels. Each of the four Gospels gives us a different view of Christ. You, consider, you can consider the four Gospels not a portrait of Christ, but a statue. And the difference between a portrait and a statue is, in a portrait, you get one perspective. And it doesn't matter where you move, you only see the same image. But in a statue, you can go around and see that image from every direction. And that's what the four Gospels do. They give us four unique perspectives on Christ. And so today we will begin with the Gospel of Matthew and the message will be the Royal Christmas. Will you turn with me to Matthew chapter 1 verses 17 to 25. Matthew 1 17 to 25. Thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile uh, in Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. This is how the birth of Jesus came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Now, I have to ask you, is there anyone here that does not believe that had to have been the most difficult conversation to have ever had? There has now been exactly one immaculate conception, one virgin birth. And yet, if a woman came to a man today and said, the Holy Spirit did it, how do you think that conversation would go? So I want you to think about just from that, the difficulty that both of these people faced. Her knowing the, 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 the extreme potential for rejection by him. Him experiencing the deep hurt of betrayal that he had to have contemplated. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus." because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son 
and he gave him the name Jesus. I want you to think about Matthew's gospel. Matthew is the gospel of the king. It presents Jesus as the king. It begins right in the first verse, Matthew 1, 1. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Why were those two men picked? Why of all the people that could have been included in Jesus' lineage, and there are a slew of them, were those two picked? Because those two represent the two facets of Jesus' kingship. Abraham declares that he is a Jew. He is the descendant of the promise that God gave to Abraham that I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you and through you all the nations of the world will be blessed. And why David? Because David represents the line of royalty. If there is to be a king, he must come from David's throne. That's what Isaiah said. Remember those Christmas verses? The ones that, that are so often enshrined in Christmas cards from Isaiah, written 600 years before Jesus' birth. I want you to think about it. How long ago 1600 years or 600 years is? Think about that. 600 years ago, there was no contact. And I know they say, well, Eric the Red came to America in, in the uh, 1000 AD. But they came, they looked around, said it's all snow, turned around and left. And for the next 500 years, there was no contact between Europe and America whatsoever. Now, there's a lot of people, and when I went to, to school, um, that there were people who erroneously said, well, they believed that, that the earth was flat. Uh, and that, that Now, superstitious people may very well have believed that the earth is flat. There are people today who still uh, try to claim that the earth is flat. But... As far back as the Greeks, in, in the years before Christ, the, the people who were intelligent, the intelligentsia of the world, the learned people of the world, had figured out that the world was round. Do you know how they figured that out? It's very interesting. They figured that out because when a boat would come into harbor, they would be looking out for boats arriving. When the boat arrived over the water, the top of the mast would appear first. And then slowly the boat would rise up till it could be fully seen and it would come into the harbor. If the world was flat, the first thing you'd see would be the prow because it's the most forward part of the ship. But you didn't see the most forward part first, you saw the top part first. The reason that no one wanted to finance Christopher Columbus was they said, yeah, the world's round, but it's 25,000 miles around. They figured that out pretty precisely. And it's too far to sail to get to China going that way. you got to go that way. And he said, oh, no, no, the earth's only 10,000 miles around. They said, you're crazy. But somebody said, hey, give him a shot. And he got three boats. Columbus wasn't right about that, right? The world's 25,000 miles in diameter, not 10. But 600 years ago, none of that. They didn't know America existed. Anywhere in Europe and Asia.
forget about technology. Do you know what hadn't been invented yet? A simple clock that could keep accurate time so that they could measure how far they traveled over the ocean. Several hundred years after Columbus, the British developed a very accurate clock to be placed on ships. And that changed the world. You think about the technology that has blossomed in the last 30 years. Think about the change in life 600 years ago. And yet 600 years before Christ, here's what Isaiah says about Jesus. Of the increase, Isaiah 9, 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom and establish and uphold it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The hymn says, Jesus shall reign where'er the sun does its successive journeys run. So the prophecy is given and it will be fulfilled. Jesus is of the royal line of David. Do you know how far back the promise of Messiah goes. Has anybody ever seen this verse? Turn with me to Genesis 49. Genesis 49. All the way back. In the very beginning days of Israel. In the days long before Israel was a nation. When Israel was just a family of people traipsing as nomads through the desert. When they had to go to Egypt simply to survive. In those days, here's what it says, Genesis 49 verse 10. Genesis 49 10. The scepter will not depart from Judah. Genesis 49 10 nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. Jesus will reign ere the sun does its successive journeys run. Look at what Daniel says about this. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. I'm Daniel chapter 7. Verses 13 and 14. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. In my vision at night, Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All peoples, nations and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. The Christmas story is about the birth of a king. That's why the wise men came, Matthew chapter 2. That's why the wise men came saying, Where is He who is born? The king of the Jews. Now, it's always struck me as, as so insane 
that of all the people in the world, all the Jewish scholars, all the rabbis, all the synagogue leaders, all of, of the, the, the temple priests in Jerusalem, all uh, of the scholars who studied the Torah day and night, that it took a bunch of pagan astrologers to come seeking the king. Where was the line of Jewish scholars waiting for his appearing? Why was it that pagan astrologers came saying, where is the one who's born the king of the Jews? But I want you to notice something else unique about Matthew's Christmas story. It's the only Christmas story that really is built around the topic of opposition. In Luke's Gospel, which we'll be getting to, his birth is ignored. What's the theme of Luke's Gospel? Christmas story? No room. We'll talk about Mark's when we get to that. And that will actually be the final one on Christmas Eve. John's Gospel tells us the Word became flesh and lived among us. And we beheld His glory. But the testimony of Matthew is one of opposition. Notice Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. Matthew 2, 16. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and in, in its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Now this isn't out of character for Herod. Herod had already killed a number of his own sons. Most of whom were probably innocent, but he had some small suspicion that maybe they might be thinking about supplanting him, and he had them killed. So it's not in any way out of character that Herod would send in the butchers to massacre the babies of Bethlehem. But it speaks to the opposition to Jesus. Why would there be so much opposition? Well, it comes in the gospel of the king because that's where the opposition to Jesus comes. Let's be honest. The world does not hate Jesus as a little baby. That's why Christmas is probably the most popular Christian event in the wide world. You can go to secular malls where they would never consider playing Christian music. And it blares through the speaker the entire Christmas season. You can go to a government that says, we want the Ten Commandments ripped off the walls of courthouses. We want the Lord's Prayer taken out of schools. We want the Bible to disappear from classrooms. But we'll have the lighting of the national Christmas tree.
The baby Jesus isn't the problem. The baby King Jesus is. You see, here's what the Bible tells us. Look with me over at Psalm 2. I was having a conversation with a practicing Jew this week. And it was the, the, the topic came up, why is there so much hatred? And, and right now we see the hatred of Jews around the world as people are just making insane statements about Israel. Israel has suffered the, 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 the history of having 25,000 rockets shot at it over the last several years. People say, well, that's not right. It was only 5,000. They suffered 5,000 in one night. Can you imagine for one second if someone shot 25,000 rockets at any city in the United States? What would happen within 12 hours? There wouldn't be a lot to report. But Israel's just supposed to take it. And when they tell them, we're going to come in and get rid of this garbage, move out of the way, we don't want to kill the civilians, they're accused of genocide. It's insane, isn't it? But, but her comment back to me was, you know, people think about that and they, say, they talk about how much there's, there's persecution of the Jews right now, but they hate Christians just as much. And you know, they do. Why is it that we live in a day when they talk about inclusion? And that inclusion is, is extended to every group in America except believers in Christ. We want to have transsexuals reading stories to kids in school. But if someone were to propose that pastors go in and read from the Bible, can you imagine the response to that? Well, I thought we wanted inclusion. Why is there so much opposition? And I, I turned with her to her own Hebrew scriptures and to these words in Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire? Psalm 2.1 And the peoples plot in vain. There is a conspiracy. There's a conspiracy between the media Companies like Disney and others, but Disney's leading the charge. And politicians and news organizations. There's a conspiracy among them to supplant the truth with lies. It's not happenstance. They're willing to pay hundreds of millions of dollars to do that. Do you understand that in one month, one month, November 2023, Disney lost 500 billion, uh, 500 million dollars, one half billion dollars just on their movies in one month. They've lost 1.2 or so billion dollars just this year on the movies they've put out. That doesn't count the over half a billion dollars a quarter they've lost on Disney+. Plus. And they filed in their own F uh, FCC filings that they know that their political stands 
for quote-unquote social justice are costing them the hearts of the American people, but they're going to do it anyway. Why? Because the nations conspire against the Lord and His anointed. Look at verse 2. The kings of the earth take their stand. And the rulers gather together against the Lord and against His anointed one. You see, as soon as we say Jesus is king, the world says, oh, no, 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 no. We don't care if he's just a little baby. Do a way with him. Jesus told a parable. It's found in Luke chapter 19. It's the parable of the Mene, and he talks about a man who was going on a far country to be made king. And he called his servants together and entrusted them with his properties. And he went on his journey. But here's what it says in, in Luke 19.14. Luke 19.14. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we don't want this man to be our king. Who is God tell me when and where I can have sex? Who is God to tell me how I should treat other people? Who is God to tell me that I can't live for number one? Genesis 3.5 tells us the lie that began humanity's downfall. Genesis 3.5, the serpent came to Eve and he said, the moment you eat this fruit, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God. You will be able, and, and it's translated, you will be able to know good and evil. But, but it's not, you'll know what God has declared as good and evil. That would be wonderful. That word know there is, you will be able to determine for yourself what's good and what's evil. You'll say what's good. You'll say what's evil. God says, don't commit adultery. How many kids today are growing up in smashed homes? Do you realize that, that there are segments of our society today that 70% of the kids growing up are growing up without both of their parents? 70%. Do you know that that same 70% who are growing up with both, without both of their parents have about 10 times the representation in prisons of any other group in America? But we want to make all kinds of excuses that systemic racism, it is, it, is, it is economic inequality. No, it's because we've destroyed the families. And we are subjugating our children to these lies. And we say, God, who are you to intervene? If we want to destroy our children, step away, God. We'll make our own rules, thank you. That's what it says in Psalm 2 here. Look at what it says, Psalm 2.3. Psalm 2.3. The kings of the earth, too, 
take their stand, the rulers gather together against the Lord and His anointed one, saying, let us break their chains. I was reading an article just this week about Gen Z and how Gen Z is finally the first generation that sees marriage as irrelevant. And that's a good thing. Let us break their bands. For all of human history going back before time was recorded, they said strong families were the foundation of life. We know better. We'll break their bands. We'll do it our way, because we know what all those ignoramuses of the past missed. I need to be me and express my wants and my desires. And that king, born in a manger, confronts me and says, oh no, he's king. Matthew 21. In Matthew 21, Jesus told another parable. And he says, There was once a landowner. That's what Genesis 1 1 is all about. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. If I make it, who's it belong to? Me. It's amazing. We can't figure that out in the technologically sophisticated world, but you go to, to the most uh, back, so-called backward tribe in the world and they understand that immediately. If I made it, it's mine. God created the world. It belongs to Him. That's what one of the three things that Genesis is all about. God made it. It's His. And it says, this land odor he built a tower on his land and he surrounded it with a wall and he planted a garden and, and that's what we have. People talk about overpopulation, but do you understand that we're feeding 8 billion people on earth just fine? I remember 40 years ago they were predicting there'll be mass starvation. I remember reading all the things. I did a a report in high school because I was I was learning about farming uh, about how there was going to be such starvation around the world because there was never going to be enough food to be feed four billion people we've doubled that we have eight billion and there's plenty of food you say well there's people starving around the world there are do you know why yeah, because it's a deliberate plot by their governments to suppress them. God planted a garden. And it says he brought in tenants and said, you can use it. Just give me my due. And they took that world, and we have taken this world, haven't we? And we've exploited its riches. We've used it to build things that our ancestors couldn't dream about. Can you imagine if you have shown something like a simple automobile to someone 2,000 years ago, what they would have thought of it? The idea that you could hurtle down the highway at 70 miles an hour in, in relative safety, in comfort, with in the summer cool air blowing in your face? Music playing in the air around you? Push a button and talk to someone a thousand miles away? Do you know what they'd have said about that? That must be heaven. And yet we take it for granted. God gave us such a garden. And then it says the landowner sent some representatives. They're called the prophets. What the whole Jewish scriptures are about. And said, 
Give the landowner his due. Worship God and him only. That's all he asks. And it says they beat some and they hurt others. They drove others out naked and oppressed them. And finally, the landowner was so distraught. How can I get their attention? Jesus said, the landowner said, I'll send my son. Surely they'll respect my son. Matthew 21, 37. Surely they'll respect my son. And it says the tenants took the son and said, he's the heir. If we kill him, we can keep it all for ourselves. And they did just that. You see, the Christmas of the king is not a Christmas we really want to contemplate. I want you to think about that this Christmas and how Christmas is presented in the Christian church in America. The songs that we sang this morning all highlight something that our godly forefathers really acknowledged and that is He rules the world. We don't talk about that in the church very often anymore, do we? Jesus is our best friend. He's the guy that can help you with your life, having your life plan and succeeding in your goals and your means and your ways. And, and God is just there to bless you in what you want. But Matthew's Gospel says, no. God sent us a king to rule over us in justice. And that's why, what is salvation? Well, salvation's praying to receive Jesus as your Savior. Absolutely not. That is not salvation. Romans is 100% clear. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10.13 But if you will confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in, his heart, in your heart God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Notice what Psalm 2 says about that. Psalm 2, verses 10 to 12. Psalm 2, 10 to 12. Here's the upshot of Psalm 2. It starts with the kings of the earth and the people, all, the whole world, conspiring against God, shaking their fingers, saying, God, you get out of here. We'll do it our way. Thank you. Here's how it ends. Therefore, you kings, you presidents, you senators, you business owners, you capital uh, managers, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you be destroyed in your way. For His wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. Romans chapter 14 verse 11 says this. Romans 14 11, That at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. That's what Matthew's Christmas story is all about. We will bow. Herod said, I'll kill him one way or another. Guess who ended up bowing in the end? 
Herod only lived about six months, give or take, after the birth of Jesus. Can you imagine the moment Herod stepped out into eternity? The horror that he must have faced because he thought he could be king instead of him. But we don't have to look to history. All we have to look to is our own hearts. Have you received Jesus as your king today? Let's bow together. Oh God, I thank you that from the beginning of the Christmas story, from Matthew's very first account, we see the reason that you sent your Son to be the Lord. The one to whom all the world will bow. The one whose dominion will be everlasting. The one who will bring glory beyond human expectation for time that cannot be measured. The one who shall reign beyond the islands of the sea. O oh God, may we today bow our knee before we are driven to the ground by the angels on all of those who have refused to bow willingly. May we celebrate the birth of the, our King. In Jesus' name, amen.